That's pretty cool. So uh, I want to welcome you here to track four. These are the hardcore, die hard uh, derbyites. Uh, Blue team for life, yo. <laughs> so uh, I'm interesting. I was asked to uh, submit a proposal, got accepted, and I thought I would wrote a very interesting uh, little uh, ditty about uh, what we're going to talk about. My name's Krobe. I uh, I do security and stuff. I uh, worked a couple different places, and today we're going to talk about the exciting world of security architecture. So uh, this is uh, kind of what drew you in, and I tried to be uh, very obtuse and not really talk about what I was going to talk about. Uh, but so circles and boxes. So everyone here obviously is incredibly excited to learn about circles and boxes. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I have a, a small little bit of a warning for you. Uh, I'm just a guy. I do some stuff. Um, hopefully today we can kind of learn a little bit about um, how to interact better with the business and interact better with our different <clears throat> constituents that exist within the organization. So today we're going to learn about circles and boxes and lines connecting circles and boxes, bo lines connecting boxes to circles, circles inside of circles, lead power pointing, uh, unicorns and pirates, and uh, security architecture. And ideally, we'll be told through the venue of cat mems and other assorted internet things. So, in the short little survey here, who here either has a security architect at their place or your role is something to do with security architecture? Awesome. Cool, cool, cool. So, a lot of people have different opinions, different thoughts in their head. Dear clicker. Click. Damn you. So I'm an architect, and that went off the screen. That's awesome. So a lot of people, when you think about architects, might think of this guy. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And I actually do work in an office just like that in my underground bunker. Uh, other people might think of somebody like this guy. He's got a really cool protractor. He's designing a model, probably a model of a model. Other folks, like real architects, might think of this guy. Uh, pretty amazing character in the world of architecture. But myself, I like to think of this fella <laughs> when I say architect. But please, I'm glad that there's so many architects here because I won't get tomatoes and pitchforks and torches and such. Uh, in, in the world of architecture, there are a lot of different jobs. And uh, if you're lucky enough to be in an organization that has architecture as a discipline, normally the EA, the enterprise architects, are up at the top of the world. And then you'll have uh, solution architects that might own either a, a, a particular application or infrastructure. You might have infrastructure architects, uh, app architects, and myself, we're in security architecture. And I think it's a very similar discipline to enterprise architecture because when you're looking at infrastructure or solution architecture, it tends to be very focused on a thing. We run online banking. We do the payroll system. And those folks are experts in a thing or a subset of technologies. Whereas enterprise <laughs> architecture and security architecture, we have a very broad focus of things we have to, are responsible for. Uh, but at the end of the day, we all kind of just end up doing PowerPoint. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> and one more to warning, don't ever make an architect angry. Uh, they got it, good. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to talk about our problem, and our problem is uh, business is very complex and moves at an incredibly fast pace. It's part of our responsibility to help deliver cost-effective solutions to the business, um, and we need to tie together a lot of different technologies or processes that may, weren't originally designed to work together necessarily. Uh, and I, I would say that, oh, I cut off the bottom, man. One does not simply catch up with architecture. Uh, and I, I, I propose to you that the technologies and the amount of the volume of people we have to work with has far outpaced the ability to simply sit down together in a conference room and whiteboard something out or go to the bar, pop the napkin out and draw some little doodles. 
uh, the complexity of what we have to manage and the amount of risks we have to account for is, is far surpasses that. And at the end of the day, our job is to help articulate complex uh, business problems and I try to find procedural or technical solutions to help solve those. I play with models. It's pretty cool. Uh, don't call them dolls. So circles and boxes. This is what the inspiration for the talk was. A lot of what I do, and when I'm not doing PowerPoint, uh, you're trying to diagram out things and use circles and boxes and triangles and rectangles and ovals and squares. It's great. Which brings me to my first tangent. <laughs> so I was looking for, for this graphic, you know, whiteboard circle diagram. And my dear friend Google afforded me a large variety of whiteboard things. So I want to share with you in my preparing for this presentation some of the things we saw. A lot of the people in IT are amazing artists. Am I in the way? I, I can move on. I, I don't know where the best spot to be is. How far can I go? How low can you go? All the way outside? Can we go to track two? <laughs> but it's, it's interesting that it, whiteboards are pretty fun. You get to play with them. Uh, there's some amazing artists out there in IT or wherever. Uh, some of this stuff is just impressive. Uh, this one was cool. Uh, pirate ship with butterflies. And uh, we'll kind of leave you with Calvin and Hobbes. So whiteboards. What were I say? Circles, right. So this is a, a model put together by the uh, Open Enterprise uh, Security Architecture Group. If anyone's familiar with TOGAF and uh, the Open Group, they did a, a little project uh, for security architecture. And this is a, a model of kind of how an information security program could be put together. On, on the outer layers, you have program management and governance. That's the strategy. That's the kind of the why and a little bit of the how. You know, you should, we, we should not go to jail for giving away huh, sensitive data, that type of stuff. We don't want to violate our customers' trust. And, and in the middle, you have operations. And these are the guys and gals that actually do stuff. Uh, they sit down at the keyboard and they type some things and they work through problems and they're, they're fixing stuff. But this exciting green bot, the green circle, is security architecture. And from my perspective, security architecture is really the glue that holds together a security program. We have to translate this esoteric stuff, we must be PCI compliant, um, down to I have a WebSphere server sitting on VLAN 12 <laughs> with these open ports. So it's, it's, you know, these folks' job, our job, which I'm, again, incredibly excited to see so many other fellow architects, brothers and sisters. Uh, but it's, it's our collective job to help translate this complex business problems and get it down to a technical enough level that the actual folks that push the bits can do the thing. Looking at it slightly different way with boxes, <laughs> up at the top of your program, you've got the business requirements and opportunities. You have compliance things you have to deal with. And you also have the constant, ever-present threat looming out there. And these are all the things that kind of go into this, the management, program management layer, that go into governance and that help feed security architecture. They help give us our, our, our action items, our list of things we have to go do to fix the thing. Anybody here TOGAF? Yay, TOGAFologists. Uh, TOGAF is a uh, framework for doing enterprise architecture. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's similar to ITIL for those of you that don't know TOGAF. And actually, they're, they're fairly compatible that if you're an ITIL shop, TOGAF kind of plugs in and overlays it fairly nicely. Um, it doesn't specifically address security architecture. With uh, TOGAF 9.1, they added a chapter, but before you know, TOGAF 1 through 9.0, it was, you should do some security. That was the, the sum total of stuff. Yes? Yes, I am. <laughs> 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 I'm out. So uh, 
Telegraph's a great way for doing enterprise architecture. It's a structure. It's not perfect. It tends to be a little esoteric and cloudy. Um, a, a, as you know, there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer. Uh, but it, Telegraph's pretty cool. It, it's a way of doing stuff. And that's a, a lot of EA shops will adopt that. It doesn't directly speak to how a security architect needs to do their job, though. It, it gives you some nice... Um, Here's some document types. Here's a process. Here's generally how the organization can run. And that's why we mentioned SABSA. Uh, I think is probably a little bit better methodology for, for us. It, it, it works. It, it, and, and from my perspective, I, I would advocate not a framework or a methodology. You need to go for a best of breed. Every organization is going to be a little different. They have different needs, different drivers. Uh, you're going to need to pick and choose the best of the best. And that's what I like about SAVSA is depending on what you're doing, it forces you into answering who, what, when, where, why, which is, is pretty cool. It's, people can relate to that. You know, this is why I'm doing this. This is what I have to do. Um, it, 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 it works. It helps. So I've rambled on about this esoteric stuff. Let's talk about some real-world application of this. Boxes. Who here works for either a uh, government or some type of financial services organization? All right. So you may be familiar with an organization called NIST. For those of you that aren't, uh, it's part of the federal government. They do a standard. They do a bunch of different stuff. And in the information security space, they have a lot of really good uh, documentation on how they're very prescriptive on things you can do. So NIST uh, just released this cybersecurity framework. And a lot of times, what you're going to run into with business people, we come at them with, like, Doc Brown from uh, Back to the Future with our helmet where we're trying to talk to the dog, talk to Einstein. And they think we're the guys with the tinfoil hats. And because the vocation has had the... Uh, probably well-deserved uh, label of we're, we're, we're a lot of the practitioners are into FUD. You know, I'm going to scare you. It's the end of the world. The sky is falling. It's the apocalypse. So when you come to your business partners or you're trying to talk to a developer, hey, developer, will you please do this? They, they tend to write us off because they think a lot of us are crackpots. So when you're trying to justify, I need to spend a million dollars for this infrastructure to help mitigate these risks, um, business kind of looks at it like, what? So they, they like to, they, they don't want you kind of off on this remote mountain thinking crazy things up. So they want you to prove you've done your homework. You've talked with other people. You are following some type of industry accepted good practice. And that's where the NIST cybersecurity framework comes into. Uh, it's not perfect. The, 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 none of, nothing today I'm talking about is perfect, but it does help you try to organize things. So they have several functions, and it got cut off again. Oh man! So you want you need to they divide up your controls and your processes into identify identification, protection, detection, response, and recovery. I can fairly easily divvy up all the things security does in those buckets, and then they have this layer of, they call them categories. Um, you might call them business capabilities, depending on the parlance of your organization. And um, it's pretty cool. So they give this list of stuff you should do. This, these are good things that folks in the world should do to help protect stuff. Yeah, and it, it, it's okay. And if you look at, they also get into like a subcategory level. So if we look at like risk assessment, they say you're doing threat and vulnerability information, you're getting that from different sources and you're sharing information. So they give you a list of stuff you can do. It's going to get real. There's also this other fine group of ladies and gentlemen <laughs> in the FFIEC. So anyone that is in the financial services industry, so you either are a bank or you are the potentially major shareholder of a bank, you m must a fall, you must have these folks come talk with you occasionally. They're very kind folks, and they have a wonderful little checklist that you have to follow, and they call it the FFIEC Cyber Assessment now. It's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Ish. Uh, and and you, you remember, 
uh, NIST chopped things up into certain categories. And the big selling point for the FFIE cyber assessment was it's compatible with NIST. It, it works with NIST. It's wonderful. Except you look. So I've got cyber risk management and oversight and threat intel and cybersecurity controls. That doesn't sound a lot like what NIST was talking about exactly. This is what NIST was talking about. Oh, she's saying what? <laughs> I love the what lady. So it, it's our responsibility. So our organizations are given this guidance. We have to, we operate in this framework, and our organizations given this guidance. You must we have to pass this exam, and compliance isn't necessarily security, but if you do it right, it's certainly they help each other out. So what? an architect can do is you can take this general guidance. You know, we must do these types of things. So NIST wants this thing. FFIEC wants this type of stuff. And then down on the bottom here, you can say, I have these controls. We are doing these things. So for vulnerability management, you know, we're doing patch management. We're doing security posture assessments. I have a vulnerability management program. I'm doing these things. You know, the words aren't exactly the same as these, but you have to have this matrix to help tie it all together so you can go to the business and say, I'm asking for a million dollars because of this. It's, it's kind of important. It's because of reasons. So, and it, in this group, it's not as hard to sell, but if you get into an operational group or a development group potentially, uh, metrics is really going to be the key to help you uh, selling and then trying to maintain that level of security that you want. Oh, it's going to cut off the bottom. The bottom's awesome. So metrics is a great reason. So I can say I, I'm doing vulnerability assessment. Everybody, uh, you know what Cap's secret is? He's always patching. Um, everybody has to have a patch management program. You can't exist today as an organization and not patch. Everyone has a policy that says they do. And then the policy doesn't mean you're doing it, but you have some documentation that says that's what you're doing. Most people have tools. And how do you know that your patch management program is actually mitigating the risk it's intended to? Well, you know, I, I my tool gives me a report. I have a dashboard. I, I can say, I deployed 500 patches on 30 servers this month. You can kind of measure what's going on and you can make a judgment. You know, are we happy with the, uh, you know, do we think we've mitigated the risk here? Can I move one of my eyes off of that and kind of look at something else over here? Or do I need to maybe vulnerable? Maybe I have a lot of stuff out in the DMZ and I have to spend more time to develop a process. I have to spend more attention over there because it's a riskier part of the organization. While I was doing this, oh, I cut off the attribution too. Uh, another tangent. Uh, one of the guys I work with at Red Hat uh, was he was ranting on Twitter. I know it never happens, <laughs> but he was complaining. One of the one of our jobs at Red Hat is we're responsible for incident response, so we actually write the patches to fix the thing. So uh, part bleed and poodle. That's our group. We helped helped you fix that. So he was ranting about uh, vulnerability management, and he. Kurt kind of summed it up in this little chart. Uh, do you have a problem? You know, get it documented, get a patch, tell people you're done. It's not, that's, that's it's as simple as it gets. So moving along. So we talked about the controls and, you know, for vulnerability, you know, SANS is a great org. This is the SANS top 20. Uh, so they, they tell you here are 20 really great things. So if you do these 20 things, you're probably mitigating most of the risk at your organization. And you can sit down and kind of look at, and up here they're gonna have patching, so that's gonna to apply to our vulnerability management example. Uh, this is a list of good things that we can rely on. It's not, it's, again, it's not that crazy old guy on the mountain screaming into the storm. It's actually, I have, this is what the world relies upon SANS for good advice on how to do things the right way. And instead of me inventing 20 things we could do, I'm going to save myself days of work. I'm going to say, this is a good enough list. And maybe I'll adjust one or two for my particular organization. But you know, th this is a, a pretty good pretty good list of things to do. So, so we have our guidance, and we have a list of how we can try to get to that guidance. Now we need to find some way to measure it. 
And what I've seen with all these, every framework has some type of guidance. They'll, they'll give you some way to measure themselves, a maturity level. Uh, I prefer, this is uh, Carnegie Mellon's, and also, um, who was the other person? This comes from, it's the CMMI, but it's, it was another organ. Oh, ISACA. ISACA actually publishes this one, too. Um, I like this. I think it gives you enough meat that you can say, uh, you can kind of, lump your controls in these different areas and kind of get reflect on how good or how poorly it, they might be performing. But as I mentioned several slides back, the FFIEC has a totally different maturity model. It's diff different names and categories. And that's one of the things that will get you into trouble in the boardroom is you come in and you say this and then somebody actually goes, some jerk, goes out and downloads the FFIEC document and he says, well, you said you know, we're in level two, we're developing, but FFIEC says that's immature or whatever the term was. So you, you need to make sure and state up front. So if you're prescribing, if you're trying to, you're advocating a way of doing things, uh, make sure you say up front, this is how we're going to measure ourselves. This is the source of it. And again, it's not me making up a scale, you know, one to 100. It, this is, this is real stuff. Real people use these types of things. So what we can do, is we go back to the, the NIST thing, and I can start to put in, here's all my NIST categories, they tell me what to do. You can line it up with all the FFIEC requirements, and here's what I'm doing to it. Here's you know, potentially my list of SANS top 20 stuff. That's the control. And then uh, you can start to measure yourself. You can give each one of these a score, so I can say, in risk assessment, maybe we're awesome. Maybe we're a, f a three. We're pretty mature, but maybe my uh, you know, threat sharing or documentation isn't as good. Maybe I'm a, a one and a half. Well, you can kind of score these categories out here, have it roll up into a subcategory, and then ultimately you can say in the category of identify, our maturity is a 1.7. How happy are you with a 1.7? I think a 1.7 kind of sucks. Uh, I think three is great place to be in. That's where most organizations should be at. You should be striving for a four. Um, no one ever gets to five. Five is a lie. Uh, <laughs> no one is perfect. But I, I think you should strive to. And, and so as you're going through your model, you're saying, I, I want to be very strong in vulnerability management, but I don't necessarily need to be as strong in business continuity. Maybe I, I outsource that and the vendor manages all that for me and they have a very robust, well-tested program. So I don't need to be personally as mature in that area. So I can focus my efforts and resources on something else. So now we're going to change to the more soft skills part of it. Uh, cat herding. A, a big part of our job. So we have to think these big thoughts. We. Um, try to find these frameworks that help articulate the world and articulate the problems we're trying to solve. And then we need to get people's buy-in because again, we're architects. We don't do anything. We just you know, sit around and draw circles and boxes. <laughs> we don't do anything. You know, I'm not the guy fixing the server. I'm the guy telling you you should fix a server. It's a great idea. People should do that. Um, it, it's the architect's vision. Architect's job is to have a vision. I need to articulate, we, we want to be the most secure, we want to be the best in, we want to have the least amount of risk in this area. I think we need to multi-factor everything, whatever, you need to have a vision on something. Uh, interesting thing about visions though is, uh, it's just another word for perspective, depending on what side of the table you're sitting at, uh, <laughs> it means something to different people. So it's. Our job, the architect's job, to kind of think the big thoughts. How can we possibly protect the e-commerce website? How do I make identity carry across a composite application that sits on 15 different platforms? Big problems. That's, that's our job is big problems. My pal Philosoraptor likes big problems. What if that was the case? So you start to... You, you get isolated and you start to think about these big risks. What if China wants to steal my lunch menu? That would devastate our cafeteria's operations if China had our secret recipe for Salisbury steak. It'd be awful. I like this one because it circles and boxes and triangles. 
and you, you'll get, and I, I would caution you, you know, as you're trying to be perceptive enough to avoid future risk, you want to avoid getting stuck in the ivory tower. And the ivory tower is where you get um, so uh, so wrapped up in academia or philosophical what if problems that you're not really addressing the business needs. Uh, you know, how how can I possibly make this Google Plexer talk to the flux capacitor? I, I, you, you need to think about how you're actually going to address the problems, and that. It, it, it's risky, and a lot of enterprise architecture and security architecture folks get a bad rap because you're in this ivory tower. You're off, disconnected from your customer base. You're disconnected from your business's real problems, and the solutions that you're developing, you're talking about, or the problems that you're screaming about don't really relate to what's going on in your business. And that's you know the ivory tower. We want to try to avoid that, stay away from that. The ivory tower. And and I de and what I've seen a lot of architects get into is you start screaming about all these different problems. Oh my God, this is awful. This problem here is awful. Then the next thing, this is just as awful. And you have so many kind of critical high issues that you're ranting about that they, they, people start turn they turn you off. They they don't care if if everything's so important, nothing's important. And that's where I would advocate to you: uh, be selective. It, it, like we never can get rid of all risk, and any risk is bad, but we need to kind of choose our battles. We're not going to get uh, funding. We're not going to get resources. They aren't going to listen to us if we're screaming about absolutely everything. So you need to be selective and kind of understand what your business's biggest risks are and what they're most concerned about. Question? Mm -hmm. And then just say, hey, here's a pattern library. Look there before, because right now we're ranting about that. Yeah. So, so the, the advice here was uh, pick your rant of the day, be very selective in what you do, but you want to remember everything else. Get it documented in a list of patterns, um, put it in your threat register, you know, whatever your organization uses for that type of thing, and periodically bring that out and remind people. You know, We're focused on this big thing. The business has to do this, but that doesn't mean everything else isn't just as important. And occasionally pull those out and remind folks. And Hopefully, you fix a problem someday, so one of the other issues bubbles up to the top of the list next. And you have to remember, when you're in this <laughs> struggle, uh, you're not alone. You, a person cannot do this job, cannot fix everything by themselves. Whether you, we, no one can know the thousands of technologies that exist in an organization or the thousands of processes, no one person. And it, it really does take um, a village to kind of get this stuff done. You have to build effective partnerships in your organization. So you need to build kind of the dream team. You need to have people that are executives that can talk to the executives and get you funding. You need to have developers that are partners that actually can do the thing. You need to have people on infrastructure. You need to have other architects. If you don't have the buy-in of your different partner teams, uh, you're not going to get anything done. So my advice to you is to go out, find those people that are inclined to security, that are sympathetic to your message, partner with them. Kind of understand their perspective, teach them why you have your perspective, and then eventually they can start to do the work for you as well. So instead of just a voice, now we have five voices all talking in unison, saying the same thing. Kind of my a throwaway slide here. It's in the a hole. So it, you've gone out and you've built these. So you have a framework. You've kind of identified your problems. You understand what controls you're applying to them. You've given them some, some level of criteria of importance or maturity. Now you need to have a process. And that's where software development lifecycle comes in. And if you don't have an SDLC or S SDL, how, how are you phrase it, your organization, you need to get one. You need to talk to your project managers. You need to talk to your developers because if you can get baked into those other processes in the organization, it's just much easier. It becomes par for the course. So if you get baked into the PMO's list of requirements, 
So we can have here, you know, security requirements baked in. I have an artifact. I'm handing you a list of requirements. Let's talk about what's applicable to this particular initiative. I get it in at the beginning, as opposed to you know, the day we're going live. Hey, security guys, we're going to turn this thing on. What do you think? I, I think it sucks. You've put me in an awful spot that I'm the asshole. And you know, now you have you're putting us at a lot more risk than you should. And the same thing is if you get baked into this the developers' uh, practices. Uh, Bill Senf had a great talk about security and art and uh, development working together. Really great message. If you can get baked into the developers' process, if you can get plugged, in, if you can get a tool that plugs into their IDE env environment or their source code repository, that half the job's done. If you can talk their language t instead of saying vulnerabilities, saying bugs or defects. It's going to be more palatable to them. They're going to be more understanding to do it. Um, IBM had an interesting uh, survey. Every couple of years, they come out with this uh, thing. If you can fix a security bug early on in the development lifecycle, actually, probably analysis and design, if you can fix it right as you discover it, right as it's being developed, it costs an organization about 70 bucks to fix. You know, a person, about an hour or so of somebody's time. If it gets all the way into production when it's deployed and live, that same defect costs around $7,000 to fix. Uh, so if we can get baked into the process, we're helping our organization save money. We're being more efficient. We're kind of weaving in with the existing patterns and processes. And we can, we're, we're adding value. Fix it now. The risk is gone. You know, we don't have this additional cost. We don't have downtime. We don't have a fire drill. We don't look like the bad guys because we're partnering with these folks. It's, relationships are, are, are critical to this job. You can't get, you can't do it all yourself. Um, here, here's an example of some more circles and boxes, but th these are some artifacts or processes that can help you. You know, you've got to, you need to understand up here your uh, business requirements. You have to understand what drives your business. I'm a manufacturer that has a different set of risks than a healthcare provider or a different set of risks than a software development company. You need to have a formally documented set of policies. It could be one policy. It could be a couple dozen policies. It, every organization would be a little different, but you have to have some guidance. The policies tell you why. Why am I doing this? And a very high level of what you have to do. And that's kind of analogous over here in our world. Those are kind of the guiding principles. Your guiding principles should support uh, what your business environment is and should help uh, support your policies. And below that, you've got a program reference architecture. That's the, the circle inside a circle inside a circle we talked about in the beginning from EOSA. That, that helps folk, people understand. This is art, articulates how we do the business of security. This is how we divide the labor up. And uh, ideally, your program reference architecture talks about if you have any legal or regulatory compliance, if you're using any frameworks, maybe, you know, we're a TOGAF shop, we're a SABS shop, or whatever the, whatever your uh, mode of operation is, that helps get documented in your program reference architecture. That flows down into standards and requirements. And then as you're engaged in projects, those things, those requirements, get driven into the solution architectures. And the solution architectures are put together by a series of patterns. This is your, these are use cases. And those use cases generally kind of rely to guidelines, and guidelines are operational procedures. And this little bubble here should say, actually, you know, do the stuff is what, what that says, if they would have told me a resolution to put this in. <laughs> so we're wrapping up. So some final thoughts. Don't let perfect stand in the way of good enough. We, we are all generally either very technical, very passionate people, we want to build the Mona Lisa, the Sistine Chapel. Sometimes a Denny's might be good enough. I want to build something a little less. Uh, don't get enough of the risk mitigated. Don't worry about uh, things that aren't going to happen. Don't worry that the Russian mob is out to steal Kentucky Fried Chicken's secret recipe. Uh, that you need to worry about what you need to worry about, what the particular problems are for your industry. I would say, I, I verbified a word today. Uh, you should 
communitize tribal knowledge. And this is where it kind of combats the silo that you see in an organization. I have the WebSphere team. I have the .NET team. I have the storage team. We have enterprise architecture. Everyone's kind of divided up in these little boxes, and the boxes don't talk together very well. And my suggestion is we help become the glue. We help become that communication medium between them. And each one of these little boxes, hopefully they write it down, but they probably don't. So they, they have all these little subject matter experts. There's these little areas of knowledge that are critical to the business. My suggestion is you need to get that bit, that knowledge shared across the organization. You need to cross train people. You need to share what's going on with these different groups. You need to communitize it. You need to drive perspective in the organization. You have to overcome a legacy mindset. Who here has heard and their day, their job, we've always done it this way. That's awful. I hate that. It is the worst. That makes me so angry when they say we've always done it this way. It's hard. It'll never work. We, we need to get that mindset out of the organization. And legacy isn't mainframe necessarily, but it's, it's just this static way of thinking. You need to open up people's perspectives and say, we all have a job. We have we all here for the business. We all have different ways we help the business. But let's understand that whatever we're trying to do, either we're in a very risky space or the business is looking to do something really big. We have to change. We have to adapt. Because if you're static, uh, you're going to go the way of you know, the horse and buggy. You know, it's, you're, and everybody now has Teslas. No one wants to buy horses and buggies unless you're Amish. And the Amish don't really have computers. Um, Engage early and engage often. Most Amish don't have computers. There's your takeaway. I actually knew a uh, software engineer for IBM that was Amish. <laughs> he was kind of on the fence. <laughs> he was on the bubble. Um, engage early, engage often. In your software development life cycle, get in there as soon as you can. Talk to your project management organization, your business analysts. Have them understand, we're, we have these requirements. We have these things we have to do. Whether it's a regulatory thing, I have to check the box for uh, SOX or GLBA. Or just from a, we value documentation as an organization. We want to understand when something breaks, how to fix it. You're advocating to get this documentation created. So get in there with those people that do the thing and encourage them to do the right thing early and often. Build partnerships outside of your domain. Find those security advocates. Find those people that are going to help you. And you're not always going to agree on everything, but at least you can have a good, healthy debate about why somebody may not want to do something. And hopefully, uh, mo the majority of the time, you're going to help win the argument, and they're going to help you carry out your message, help you do your job. And, and I subscribe to this methodology, you need to open source your security. You need to find peers that you can share information with, share good practices. Hey, at, at my company, we did this and it really worked. It, that might help you out and you might have a great idea that could help me out. You get peer feedback, get peer feedback. You know, there's a uh, whole information uh, sharing processes like FF ISAC where they're sharing threat intelligence. Get involved in these communities so you can understand what's going on outside of your world. And as you see things, you should say something about it. If you are experiencing something, share that with your neighbors because the guys and gals next to you are doing basically the same job. Give them a hand because maybe someday they're going to give you a hand. And I, I would also state it, it's critical for our profession is to mentor the next generation. We need to find people and groom people that can communicate effectively, that understand how to do things, and so that they can kind of carry on as we get old and die, as we, as we move on. So I, at, if you take nothing else away aside from Amish software engineers, secure all the things. We want to avoid problems like this. It could happen. <laughs> Weekly World News is the greatest. So it, be your brand. Take a hold of your identity and you know, find ways that you can communicate and work with others and be that guy or that gal and help drive effective change. I'm, I'm like RoboCop on the unicorn. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so uh, this is how to get a hold of me. What types of questions might you have that I totally confuse you? Was did this was this coherent? Yes, sir. 
Yes. Correct. So, so the uh, the question is that there are a lot of different frameworks, and they aren't necessarily universally applicable. And we talked about kind of the best of, I prescribe a best of breed approach of picking and choosing what works best for you. So the, the end question is, how are you mapping those business goals into those capabilities you need to provide? And that's uh, first and foremost, you have to talk to the business. You have to look somebody in the eye and listen to their concerns. Business people don't care about firewalls. They don't care about access control lists. They care about, I want to sell the thing, or I want to move this from here to there. You need to listen to them and understand what the business wants. Then you need to take a step back and understand legally, what are you responsible for? Am I dealing with healthcare information? Well, I better sure as hell make sure I'm watching out for HIPAA, or uh, you know, I'm looking at the privacy laws. So once you understand what the business needs, what the rules are, that's when you uh, it helps to have uh, this partnership. Um, we created a security architecture board where I invited a lot of different people in, and we talked about, okay, I went out and I surveyed the business. This is what they want to do. This is kind of the playing field we're in. Then we sat down and went through these different frameworks or these different list of controls, and we said, is this reasonable? And as a security guy, I had to do the bulk of the work ahead of time for them, but I would provide them. I have questions on these five things. Can you give, I'll show you everything, but I will specifically want to talk about these five things and whatever else you want to talk about. And we built that list of controls or that list of things we wanted to do. We built, actually built a roadmap to help lay out what the, where the organization needed to get to be, meet to that maturity level we wanted. And I absolutely agree. You don't need to be a four in everything. I think you probably should. I think three is a pretty safe goal. And three is you have processes, you have documentation, it's repeatable. Uh, four is your automated everything. Uh, so I, I, but you need to understand what's reasonable for my organization. And I agree, across the board, four is not where you want to go. Maybe. And, and exactly, you, you've provided them, a, a, these are our guiding principles. You've helped educate them. Hopefully they're making the right choices. And the, the danger is you might get drawn into something where it's too technical. I, I should not be the guy right in your firewall rule anymore. I, I was a Cisco guy like 12 years ago. Uh, I, 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 can, I can't do anything more. I can show an you know, SE, blah, and that's it. So you need to get this, the right level of technical people. And I'd also state that most organizations don't have the level of documentation they need to really understand that solution. And again, I would advocate all of you, as you're going through and you're working with different architects or developers, demand proper documentation. The people need to understand how their app works. It's just not a box on a Visio. It's this thing with a thousand open ports and these file shares talking to these different services and it's poked out to the internet, talking to somebody else, bringing in data. People need to have that clearly documented so you really truly can understand what the risk is to that system outside of this box. Any other questions, comments, tomatoes? Yes, sir. Uh, I do. I actually went out when I got my last job. I went out and I bought. There's uh, there's a series of books, and it's security architecture patterns. 
And there's actually three or four of them. And if you give me your contact information, I can send you the author. Really great guy. I think he's from South America. Uh, but there's um, security patterns in use, security architecture patterns. And they actually have one specifically to uh, services-oriented architecture, which was pretty good. And I rely upon all of those when I was doing my architecture work. Um, but yeah, give me your stuff and I'll let you know this week. Question? Mm -hmm. uh, I DevOps is a really fun term. It's it's kind of like cloud. It's uh, very very buzzy. It's it's I, I would say uh, a lot. Traditional organizations should absolutely try to find a way to better align development and operations. Depending on what your organization is, like how heavily regulated you are, uh, continuous integration isn't a great choice for a bank necessarily. <laughs> yeah, it's and it's interesting. They, um, depending on what segment you're from, um, you'll feel this pressure for DevOps, and that's where kind of tools like containerization and uh, like like Jira or integration server kind of helps out. Um, but some organizations may not feel that pressure, or like if you're in healthcare, you you absolutely cannot. There's such long life cycles and such heavy compliance, you can't do that. And it, w what I would suggest. In order to for any organization to be successful, you, you have to adapt. You have to listen. You have to be observing observant of what's going on in the world. And I think DevOps is a great. There's a lot of good things in the movement, um, but it I, I have not. And even at Red Hat, we don't we have not successfully deployed DevOps. And we're as you know open source hippy dippy as you get. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's it. But there's a lot of great things in DevOps that are from organizations like us or Google. Uh, and in a more traditional organization, you have to, I would say, again, pick your battles. Find out what, what the pain point is. Is is the business really upset that they don't have a new version of software every week? If, if they are upset about that, well, what can you do? What documentation can you get? What automation can you put in place to help the developers be able to deploy, but also get all your security scans on the back end? Um, you have all the documentation together. Um, so you, I would I, the only I don't know. There's no magic bullet, no silver bullet there. But I would say be choosy about what you want, what, what you need to do, and try to be as adaptable as possible. Oh, yeah. So it requires a lot of work up front, but if you have this library of patterns or these reference architectures, developers love that stuff. You hit, this is kind of, I'm telling you what to do, but I'm, I'm not telling you what to do. It, it, 
Yeah. So, but you hand them this stuff, and it, it's a, it's not quite, but it's almost a checklist. You need to do these types of things, and they like to do that. And solution architects also love patterns because I can, you know, I I know I what my authentication and authorization pattern is. I know what my encryption pattern is. I can just grab the solutions I need based off the requirements of the project. I can go out and grab these this library of patterns and kind of snap it together. And for DevOps especially, you need to ratchet up the uh, auditing and the governance piece much more heavily because you're not going to be able to sit in on every daily stand-up. You're not going to be able to review every piece of code unless you have a tool to do it. Um, so you need to make sure you ha you understand that there you you're in for the long haul for auditing and uh, review. Absolutely. Did I answer your question? Kind of? Awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So we have Joe saying things like non authorized disclosure party that happens to be on our own. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I want to thank everybody. I hope you learned a little something. Hope you liked laughed at some funny pictures. Have a great rest of the con. Thank you.